All right, so first let's go to app.glowforge.com and you'll need to log in with whatever email you signed up for your Glowforge with, as well as the password. If you're like me, you might have to reset your password because you forgot it. And then it, what it'll show you is a bunch of options for designs that either Glowforge has provided or ones that you have previously uploaded. Let's say we want to upload the file that we made in the last video. Let's click on Create right here. And we've got a couple of options. Uh, new Blank Design, which is where we would be using the Glowforge software to actually generate our design. Or Upload from File. So since we've already designed something, let's go ahead and grab Upload from File. Uh, and of course there's this third option, uh, Capture from Camera. So let's click on Upload from File. And now we just need to find the file on our computer. So it's called Inkscape Video Test in my case. Probably called something else in your case. Let's click open. It'll say it's being uploaded over here on the right. The uploading doesn't usually take very long, but if you have a particularly intricate design, it can take a while. So I've had it take up to about 30 minutes, but that was with an entire page just filled with cuts. So a very intricate design. I usually start in the top left corner. So I like to try and find a material that's as close to my material as possible. I work a lot in quarter inch birch plywood which I get from Home Depot or Lowe's. And that happens to be very close to the thick cherry plywood. So we can search for material thick. Oh, and there it is. And now you may notice a couple of things. So all of these suddenly changed what they were. Like instead of saying enter settings, it says engrave. Also on the screen, it turned a, a an orange color instead of a grayed out color. If you haven't set any of the settings, they'll show up as gray, and up here it'll say no artwork present, um, and, but only after you've turned on the machine. Right now the machine is off because I want to show you what it does when, when you turn on. Now there are a couple of things. I probably used a bad graphic for this uh, to use as an example. So you see my graphic has an outer border, which is not great, and it also has uh, a bunch of different options for engraving and cutting and really those all should have been kind of the same thing. So first thing I'm going to do is all this intricate detail I really don't want that to cut and then currently it says it's going to cut so I'm going to click on it and swap it to engrave. Now in the engraving you have a lot of different options so for example uh, they've, you've got resolution options here so draft is the lowest resolution, SD is medium, and HD is high. Um, I usually do draft graphic on most things, uh, but and you won't really notice it if you're doing a really solid color engrave. But if you're doing something like a photograph, or if you're doing a solid engrave on two-tone acrylic, so acrylic that's got two different colors, where you burn through one to reveal the other, you're going to want to make sure to have a higher resolution. All right. Uh, let's say I wanted to adjust these settings, because I happen to know that this engraves too deeply on my material. I'll click this little arrow off to the side. Not this one down here. This manual one, stay away from it. Because watch what happens. When I open it, it gives you the maximum possible speed and the minimum possible power. Which means it's blowing hot air on your material. And nothing's going to happen. And then you're going to post a comment saying like, ah, why is it not doing anything? And I'll say, well, did you use manual? And did you change it after you used manual? But if we click on this arrow off to the side under their settings, it says what they use for that material. Now Glowforge also sells their own materials. They're called proof grade materials. And if you're only doing a couple of projects, that probably is a good option. They're a little bit pricier than getting them at the store, but where else are you gonna get quarter inch walnut plywood or weird stuff like that? Let's say I wanted to decrease the depth of this engrave. You may notice that there isn't a setting for depth, and you can't directly control how deep something cuts in the laser. But I do have access to how fast the laser head is moving and how much power is used. And I can use either of those to decrease the depth of the cut. So if I wanted to use speed, I would have to increase the speed. That way the laser is imparting less heat on each individual area and not burning quite as deep. Unfortunately, in this case, the speed is maxed out, so I really can't adjust the speed to do that. I'm going to have to adjust the power. 
So first I'm going to click on this full power thing so that it gives me a place where I can type in a number. And let's just do maybe 50%. And that is a percentage. So that would be a good way to decrease how deep the cut goes. Now normally it's not in graves that you're going to end up tweaking. It's probably cuts and you're probably going to want to cut all the way through the material. So what will generally happen is that you'll end up with full power and you'll only be able to lower the speed because remember that increases the amount of time that it's imparting heat on a given area. And that's how lasers work. They burn through stuff. So just wanted to clear, clear that up. Uh, now you have access to a couple of other settings. So for example, if you wanted to cut through the material but didn't want to get that really charred black edge, you'd rather get it a nice golden brown edge. Maybe instead of doing it at full power and a slow speed, you might just do a couple of passes so it goes over that area more than once. You also have direct access to the lines per inch, which is the resolution. So as it goes an inch, or as the machine goes back and forth, going an inch this way, that's how many times it goes back and forth, essentially, as it goes an inch up. All right, let's go back to that. And then the focus height. That sometimes says auto, but sometimes requires you to put in a number. But if you have to put in a number, it's the thickness of your material from the top of the crumb tray. So that little black honeycomb pattern inside the bed, that's the crumb tray, and you're going to want to make sure that whatever your focus height is, is exactly that. It's okay if it's off by a little bit, but you don't want it to be too off. Uh, it ends up defocusing the laser, and then you end up not cutting all the way through, or you end up with kind of smeared looking results in an engrave. All right, so maybe I'll reduce this resolution a little bit. By the way, this increases the time that it takes. So if you're doing 1355, make sure to bring a sleeping bag because you're going to be there for a while. All right, back to one pass. Oh, and since this is the engrave, let's actually put it back to those power and speed settings I mentioned earlier. So 1,000 speed and 50 power. All right. Now, if you click on back, you're going to end up undoing all this work. So don't click on back. Just click off of that. And you can see it kept that 1,050. You may also notice that while I'm hovering over this thing over here, it actually shows up over here in blue. So you can kind of tell which thing uh, is being you're working with. Okay, so I'm going to leave that engrave the same. That's the text. This engrave, I'm going to do the same tweaking to. So let's go ahead. We're going to change this to 50 and lower the resolution to uh, 225. This one, you'll notice that it doesn't show anything there, but it, it looks like it's the square around the robot's head. I'm just going to tell that to ignore because I don't actually want it to do that. Uh, I see another circle. Oh, that's his left eye. So let's change that to an engrave and do the same tweaks that we did before. Now, if I had done my design right in the first place or chosen a better option for, for a graphic, I wouldn't have to do any of this. It would all just be one step. And ideally, that's what you would want. You'd want it all to be one step so you don't have to set the, the power and speed settings multiple times. Okay, so these are in kind of the right order, where it's got the outer border last, and this is the order that it's going to do these operations in. If it wasn't in the right order, all you have to do is click and drag to move this around. So now it would do the cut, oops, using the scroll wheel. So this would be having the outer border cutting first, which is not what I want. So I'll move back to the bottom. Okay. And then finally, I can move this around by just clicking on it and dragging. Uh, down here, this is kind of a new thing, and I don't know if it's just the trial stuff, which they've added. That's the stuff with the little diamonds on it. But it'll tell you the position in XY, like where it is on the screen, with the top left corner being zero, zero, zero. And it tells you the width and the height of your material and allows you to lock the aspect ratio so that when you scale it, uh, it scales proportionally. So let's go ahead and turn on the machine. Now before you turn on your machine, please make sure that you have ventilation set up. Okay, so one of the first things that will happen when you turn on the machine is it'll say that it's focusing. 
The Glowforge positions the head using a fisheye lens camera that's in the middle of the lid and the little logo that's on the top of the head. So the first thing it has to do is actually calibrate that. So it'll say things like focusing and centering. It'll probably move the head of your machine so that it's trying to get near the center, but then it'll jog around a little bit to fine tune it. If that doesn't happen, and instead the laser in head ends up ramming against the bottom right corner of your machine and making an awful grinding noise, turn off the machine, take a little uh, Zeiss wipe, which is one of those lens wipes, not a paper towel, that'll scratch the lens, but a lens wipe, and wipe that that camera on the inside of the lid. Then gently push the head back into the back left corner and turn the machine back on. Usually that happens because the camera can't see the logo that it's trying to target on. Okay, so now it says scanning, which means it's taking a picture of what's inside the machine, because this is, ah, oh, there we go. So now it has a picture of what's in the machine, and I can actually position my piece wherever I want it, or my design on the workpiece. Now one thing that's gonna happen to you at some point is that you're gonna end up with the piece not being visible. So it'll look something like this, and I'm just using the pan tool by holding spacebar and the scroll wheel to pan around. But it'll say something like no artwork, and you won't be able to find your piece. Use the scroll wheel and control to zoom in and out. You can usually find your artwork. And the reason it does that is just because of where you put it in your design software. So in Inkscape, if I put it way off the left side in my page border, it would end up way off the left side in here. You can also use the arrow keys to adjust these things. And I wonder, I'll bet you can probably just type in a number here, 9.5 and press enter, and it'll put it exactly where, where you want it. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, so we've set all this stuff, we've got material inside, our ventilation is set up, uh, now the next thing to do is click print. And it'll say it's preparing your print, and the laser head will actually move over your material just to make sure that there's actually material there. Again, this doesn't usually take very long, but sometimes it does if you have a particularly intricate cut. So this can take up to half an hour, but usually it's only going to be like the half, half a minute sort of thing and it'll give you a time estimate. Now, if you're doing this for the first time, it'll usually give you some sort of message that says this is your first print, and it gives you some stuff to do. Make sure you read that, click I understand. And then it'll also say things like proof grade material not found. That's if you're using materials that are not Glowforge materials. And this time estimate is accurate. So it's not like 3D printing where, you know, 3D printers lie to you about how long they're going to take. This is accurate, so you can actually bank on it. And now the machine, the button on the machine is actually glowing. So if you, all you have to do is press that glowing button, just like it says right here, and it'll start the print. Make sure that you stick around for your print. Never leave a print unattended. Uh, even if you've done the cut a thousand times, something can go wrong in the machine and cause a fire. And at some point, you will set fires in your laser. You just make, need to make sure that they're not big fires. All right, so let's press the button. Now, as it's printing, it's kind of loud, but it also gives you a countdown timer up here. But it doesn't update anything on the screen, so you're never going to see the laser itself cutting in here. All right, and the print is done. Now we just need to wait for it to finish cooling down, and it'll take a picture. And I want you to notice a couple of things in this picture. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit. First thing you may notice is it's not 100% accurate. So the cut is not exactly where I told it to be. It can be off by as much as like an eighth of an inch, but generally it's more like a 16th of an inch. Uh, but 
there are ways to get this 100% accurate, but they're outside the scope of this video. So I wouldn't recommend starting with grandma's heirloom snuff box and engraving her name on it or something like that. Start with something simple, like a name tag. And I'm gonna move this out of the way. Now the other thing I want you to notice is that there's this kind of fuzzy region to the bottom side of, of each of these cuts. And that's residue that's coming from the plywood and from the, the glue in the plywood, as well as just the, the wood in the plywood. And there are a couple of ways to deal with that. So the first way and the way that I see used most often is to mask it off using something like masking tape or painter's tape and just mask it off so that when you're done with the engraving, you can just peel all of that residue off. And that works great. Uh, the only problem is imagine trying to get little bits of, of tape off of each of these little teeth on this robot's head. Or imagine trying to get it out of the little area in that E or the little area in that A. It's going to be rather tedious, and with plywood, you're going to you may end up pulling off that top layer of ply, and ending up having to redo the whole print. So what I typically do is I just cut it unmasked. Sometimes I'll mask the bottom side because the bottom side actually gets scorched. It's not just the residue. But I'll print it with the top side uncovered, and then I just take a little bit of denatured alcohol and wipe it across. And it'll usually pull off all of that residue and doesn't impact stain or finishing or anything like that. Uh, and it works really nicely. You do want to make sure to do that very close to when you've actually made the print. Because if you wait too long, what will happen is that it'll end up setting up and it just becomes harder and harder to wipe off. So uh, do it early rather than late. Now for acrylic, please do not do that. Acrylic does not respond well to denatured alcohol or alcohol of any variety so uh, don't do that on acrylic just leave that protective coating on the acrylic and peel it off after you're done with the engraving all right well thanks for joining me i'll see you next time